Extra boom. <laughs> I had to get the uh, that thing lit up. All right. How are we doing, folks? That's kind of a redundant question right now, but anyway. <sighs> this is going to be a heck of a journey. So same thing as last week. I'm going to go for about two hours or um, until I run out of steam, whichever comes last. Or something like that. Right then. Okay. Uh, book one, chapter 18. How Janotus de Bragmardo <laughs> was sent to Gargantua to recover the great bells. Master Janotus, with his hair cut round like a dish a la Caesarian, in his most antique accoutrement, the repipionated with a graduate's hood, and having sufficiently antidoted his stomach with oven marmalades, that is, bread and holy water of the cellar, transported himself to the lodging of Gargantua, driving before him three red-muzzled beetles, and dragging after him five or six artless masters, all thoroughly bedaggled out, sorry, all thoroughly bedaggled with the mire of the streets. At their entrance, at their entry, Panocrates met them, who was afraid, seeing them so disguised, and thought they had been some maskers out of their wits, which moved him to inquire of one of the said artless masters of the company what this mummery meant. Hi there. It was answered him that they desired to have their bells restored to them. As soon as Panocrates heard that, he ran in all haste to carry the news unto Gargantua, that he might be ready to answer them, and speedily resolve what was to be done. Gargantua, being advised thereof, or advertised thereof, called apart his schoolmaster Panocrates, Philotimus, steward of his house, Gymnastes, his esquire, and Eudemon, and very summarily, summarily conferred with them, both of what he should do and what answer he should give. They were all of opinion that they should bring them unto the goblet office, which is the buttery, and there make them drink like roisters and line their jackets soundly. And that this coffer might not be puffed up with vainglory by thinking the bells were restored at his request, they sent, whilst he was chopining and plying the pot, for the mayor of the city, the rector of the faculty, and the vicar of the church, unto whom they resolved to deliver the bells before the sophister had propounded his commission. After that, in their hearing, he should pronounce his gallant oration, which was done, and they being come, the sophister was brought in full hall, and began as followeth in coughing. I neglected to uh, mute my discord, so I, well, we'll see what's going on. <clears throat> Sorry, somebody else can tell me what's going on. I shouldn't look. All right, uh, excuse me. There we go. Book one, chapter 19. The Oration of Master Genotus de Bragmardo for Recovery of the Bells. I feel like I should have had a bottle of rye or something here. Just mm, bang the bottle down. Hem, hem. Good day, sirs. Good day. A vorbis, my masters. It were but reason that you should restore to us our bells, for we have great need of them. Hem, hem. Ay, fashash. We have oftentimes heretofore refused good money for them of those of London and Cahors, yea, and those of Bordeaux and Marie, who would have bought them for the substantific, substantific quality of the elementary complexion, which is introdificated in the terrestriety of their quidditative nature, to extraneize the blasting mists and whirlwinds upon our vines, indeed not ours, but those round about us. For if we lose the pio and liquor of the grape, we lose all, both sense and law. If you restore them unto us at my request, I shall gain by it six basketfuls of sausages and a fine pair of breeches, which will do my legs a great deal of good, or else they will not keep their promise to me. Oh, by gob, Damine, a pair of breeches is good. Hey, we are sapiens non apparet am. Ha-ha! <laughs> a pair of breeches is not so easily got. I have experience of it myself. Ah. Oh. Consider, Damine, I have been these eighteen years in metagrabalizing this grave speech. Heredit quae sunt Caesaris, Caesari e quae sunt Deo, ibi jacet lepus. By my faith, Damine, 
if you will sup with me in cameras by cock's body charitatis nos faciemis bonum cherbin. Ergo occidentum porsum, e ego habit bonum vino, but of good wine we cannot make bad Latin. Well, de part de dat nobis bellas nostras. Hold, I give you in the name of the faculty a sermons de utino, that utinam you would give us our bells. Vultis etiam pardonos, per diam vos habet batis, e nihil peabetis. Actually, I, I will uh, take pause, and I translated a whole bunch of the Latin, just peeking ahead, and uh, yeah, it very much is. I know Robin, Karate, and three other Japanese words. Some of them, gets, it gets particularly silly as we go along. Unfortunately, the humor is lost to us who aren't so good in, in Latin, I suppose, but... Oh, sir, domine, bella giviminimor nobis, verily est bonum vobis. They are useful to everybody. If they fit your mare well, so do they our faculty. Que comparata est gemantis incipientibus, a similis facta est cis. Wow, I'm just going to mangle this. Salmo nesio quo. Yet did I quote it in my notebook. A est unum bonum Achilles, in go a good defending argument. Hum, 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 hi hash. For I prove unto you that you should give me them. Ergo sic argumentor. Omnis bella bellabis in bellerio bellando, bellans, bellativo, bellarfesit, bellabilitor bellantes. Now that one I remember is like, in warfare there is war, in war there is warfare, in warfare there is war, war there is warfare. Parisius habit bellas, ergo gluck, ha ha ha. This is spoken to some purpose. It is in tertio prime, in dairy, or elsewhere. By my soul, I have seen the time I could play the devil in arguing, but now I am much failed, and henceforward want nothing but a good, but a cup of good wine, a good bed, a back, my back to the fire, my belly to the table, and a good deep dish. Actually, I kind of respect that. Hey, Demean, I beseech you, in nomine patris fili e spiritus sancti, amen, to restore unto us our bells, and God keep you from evil, and our lady from health. Qui vivit e regnat per omnia secula seculorum, amen. Hum, hakachu kokshash, kzakshem hash hash. I'm supposed to be more coughing. I didn't feel like doing it. Verum in im vero. Quando quidem dubio procul, et apol quonium ita certe medius fidus, fidus. A town without bells is like a blind man without a staff, an ass without a crupper, and a cow without symbols. Therefore, be assured, until you have restored them unto us, we will never leave crying after you, like a blind man that has lost his staff, braying like an ass without a crupper, and making a noise like a cow without symbols. A certain Latinisator, dwelling near the hospital, said since, producing the authority of one Tamponus, I lie, it were one Pontanus, the secular poet, who wished those bells had been made of feathers, and the clapper of a foxtail, to the end that they might have begot a chronicle in the bowels of his brain, when he was about the composing of his Carmini formal lines. But nac pectetin petatac, tic torch lorg, or rot kippiper kippipo, put pansy malf, he was declared an heretic. We make them as of wax. And no more saith the opponent. Valete e plaudit, calipinis resunci. He ran out of Latin at the end, he was just making up gibberish. <laughs> hmm. Chapter 1, Part 20. How the sophister carried away his cloth, and how he had a suit in law against the other masters. The sophister had no sooner ended, but Panocrates and Eudemon burst out in a laughing so heartily that they had almost split with it, and given up the ghost in rendering their souls to God, even just as Crassus did, seeing a lubberly ass eat thistles. And as Philemon, who, for seeing an ass eat those figs which were provided for his own dinner, died with force of laughing. Laughing. Ugh. Together with them, Master Genotus fell a-laughing too, as fast as he could, 
in which mood of laughing they continued so long that their eyes did water by the vehement concussion of the substance of the brain, by which these lacrimal humidities, being pressed out, glided through the optic nerves, and so to the full represented Democritus Heraclitizing and Heraclitus Democratizing. I just like, they, they laughed so hard they gave themselves a concussion. When they had done laughing, Gargantua consulted with the prime of his retinue what should be done. There, Panocrates was of opinion that they should make this fair orator drink again, and seeing he had shown them more pastime, and made them laugh more than a natural soul could have done, that they should give him ten baskets full of sausages, mentioned in his pleasant speech, for the pair of hoes, three hundred Greek billets of logwood, five and twenty hogsheads of wine, a good large down bed, and a deep capacious dish, which he said were necessary for his old age. All this was done as they did appoint, only Gargantua, doubting that they could not quickly find out breeches fit for his wearing, because he knew not what fashion would best become the said orator, whether the martingale fashion of breeches, wherein is a spung hole with a drawbridge for the more easing kegging, or the fashion of the mariners, for the greater solace and comfort of his kidneys, or that of the Switzers, which keeps warm the bedondane or belly tabret, or round breeches with straight canyons, having in the seat a piece like a cod's tail, for fear of overheating his reins. All which considered, he caused to be given him seven ells of white cloth for the linings. The wood was carried by the porters, the master of arts carried the sausages and the dishes, and Master Genotus himself would carry the cloth. One of the said masters, called Jus Bandouille, showed him that it was not seemly nor decent for one of his condition to do so, and that therefore he should deliver it to one of them. Ha! said Genotus. Bode, bode, or blockhead, blockhead, thou dost not conclude in modo e figura, for lo, to this end serve the su suppositions in parva logicalia. Panis pro quo supponit? Confuse, said Bandui, a distributive. I do not ask thee, said Genotus, blockhead, quo modo supponit, but pro quo? It is, blockhead, pro tibis meus, and therefore I will carry it. Igomet sicum suppositum portat depositum. So he did carry it away very close and covertly, as Petalin the buffoon did his cloth. The best was that when this coffer in a full actor assembly held at the Matherins uh, had with great confidence required his breeches and sausages, and that they were flatly denied him because he had them of Gargantua, according to the informations thereupon made, he showed them that this was gratis, and out of his liberality, by which they were not of any sort quit of their promises. Notwithstanding this, it was answered him that he should be content with reason without expectation of any other bribe there. Reason? said Genotus. We use none of it here. Unlucky traitors, you are not worth the hanging. The earth beareth not more errant villains than you are. I know it well enough. Halt not before the lame. I have practiced witness. <laughs> Let me try that again. Do some lawyers kind of do the whole <laughs> thing as well? Because I feel like that's kind of mandatory if you're going to be some kind of blowhard speaker. I have pra practiced wickedness with you. By God's rattle, I will inform the king of the enormous abuses that are forged here and carried underhand by you. And let me be a leper, if he do not burn you alive like sodomites, traitors, heretics, and seducers, enemies to God and virtue. Upon these words they framed articles against him. He on the other side warned them to appear. In sum, the process was retained by the court, and is there as yet. Hereupon the magisters made a vow never to decrot themselves in rubbing off the dirt of either their shoes or clothes. Master Genotus, with his adherents, vowed never to blow or snuff their noses until judgment were given by a definitive sentence. By these vows do they continue unto this time both dirty and snotty, for the court hath not garbled, sifted, and fully looked into all the pieces as yet. The judgment or decree shall be given out and pronounced at the next Greek calends, that is, never. As you know, 
that they do more than nature and contrary to their own articles. The Articles of Paris maintain that to God alone belongs infinity, and nature produceth nothing that is immortal. For she putteth an end in period to all things by her engendered, according to the saying, Omnia orta cadunt, etc. But these thick mist swallowers make the suits in law depending before them both infinite and immortal. In doing whereof, they have given occasion to, and verified the sayings of Kilo the Lacedaemonian, consecrated to the Oracle at Delphos, that misery is the inseparable companion of law debates, and that pleaders are miserable, for sooner shall they attain to the end of their lives than to the final decision of their pretended rights. Well, that kind of got a bit heavy in a hurry. Book 1, Chapter 21 The Study of Gargantua, According to the Discipline of His Schoolmasters, uh, the Sophisters The first day being thus spent, and the bells put up again in their own place, the citizens of Paris, in acknowledgment of this courtesy, offered to maintain and feed his mare as long as he pleased, which Gargantua took in, great, took in good part, and they sent her to graze in the fields of Bière. I think she is not there now. This done, he with all his heart submitted his study to the discretion of Panocrates, who for the beginning appointed that he should do as he was accustomed, to the end he might understand by what means, in so long time, his old masters had made him so sottish and ignorant. He disposed, therefore, of his time in such fashion, that ordinarily he did awake between betwixt eight and nine o'clock, whether it was day or not, for so had his ancient governors ordained, alleging that which David saith, Vanum est vobes sante lusum suger. Then he did tumble and toss, wag his legs, and wallow in the bed some time, the better to stir up and rouse his vital spirits, and apparelled himself according to the season, but willingly he would wear a great long gown of thick frieze, furred with fox skins. Afterwards he combed his head with an almain comb, which is the four fingers and the thumb. Ah, right, almain. Okay, okay, I get it. Okay, that, that's good. I'm going to steal that at some point. For his preceptor said that to comb himself otherwise, to wash and make himself neat, was to lose time in this world. Then he dunged, pissed, spewed, belched, cracked, yawned, spitted, coughed, yexed, sneezed and snotted himself like an archdeacon, and to suppress the dew and bad air, went to breakfast, having some good fried tripes, fair rashers on the coals, excellent gammons of bacon, stores of fine minced meat, and a great deal of sippet brewis, made up of the fat of the beef pot, laid upon bread, cheese, and chopped parsley strewed together. Hi, Montreth. Hopefully this will, uh, Either amuse or relax. Uh, you know, I think in the context of everything else, you could probably work out what yexing is, and we'll just kind of leave it at that. Blah, blah, blah. Where was I? Um, Panocrates showed him that he ought not to eat so soon after rising out of his bed unless he had performed some exercise beforehand. Gargantua answered, What? Have I not sufficiently well exercised myself? I have wallowed and rolled myself six or seven turns on my bed before I rose. Is that not enough? Pope Alexander did so, by the advice of a Jew, his physician, and lived till his dying day in despite of his enemies. My first masters have used me to it, saying that to breakfast made a good memory, and therefore they drank first. I am very well after it, but dine but the better. And Master Tubal who was the first licentiate at Paris, told me that it was not enough to run apace, but to set forth betimes. So doth not the total welfare of our humanity depend upon perpetual drinking in a ribble rabble, like ducks, but on drinking early in the morning, undi versus. To rise betimes is no good hour. To drink betimes is better sure. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not what you just said. It's probably like hawking or something. You know, blah. 
After that, he had thoroughly broke his fast. He went to church, and they carried to him in a great basket a huge pantoufled or thick covered breviary, weighing what in grease, clasps, parchment, and cover little more or less than 1106 pounds. There he heard six and twenty or thirty masses. This while, to the same place came his orise, orison murderer impalatoct, or lapped up about the chin like a tufted whoop, and his breath came pretty well antidoted with store of vine tree syrup. With him he mumbled all his curials and duncical brebrorians, which he so curiously thumbed and fingered, that there fell not so much as one grain to the ground. As he went from the church, they brought him, upon a dray drawn with oxen, a confused heap of paternosters and aves of St. Claude, every one of them being of the bigness of a hat-block. And thus walking through the cloisters, galleries, or garden, he said more in turning them over than sixteen hermits would have done. Then did he study some paltry half-hour with his eyes fixed upon his book, but, as the comic saith, his mind was in the kitchen. I will absolutely refuse to continue if Gargantua is in a tanuki suit. I will rage quit. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> where was I? Uh, pissing then a full urinal, he sat down at the table, and because he was naturally phlegmatic, he began his meal with some dozens of gammons, dried and eats tongues, hard rows of mullet called bortagos, andouilles or sausages, and such other forerunners of wine. In the meanwhile, four of his folks did cast into his mouth one after another continually mustered by whole shovelfuls. Immediately after that, he drank a horrible draught of white wine for the ease of his kidneys. When that was done, he ate according to the seasoned meat agreeable to his appetite, and then left off eating when his belly began to strout, for, and was like to crack for fullness. As for his drinking, he had that it, blah, he had in that neither end nor rule, for he was wont to say that the limits and bounds of drinking were when the cork of the shoes of him that drinketh swelleth up half a foot high. All right, this is going to be a bit of a journey. Chapter 1, Book 22, The Games of Gargantua. I guess it was Book 1, Chapter 22, whatever. It's still, it's still the games of Gargantua, though. Then, blockishly mumbling with a set on countenance a piece of scurvy grace, he washed his hands in fresh wine, picked his teeth with the foot of a hog, and talked, jo talked jovially with his attendants. Then, the carpet being spread, they brought plenty of cards, many dice, with great store and abundance of checkers and chessboards. There he played, at flush, at love, at primero, at the chess, at the beast, at Renard the fox, at the rifle, at the squares, at trump, at the cows, at the prick and spare not, at the lottery, at the hundred, at the chance or mum chance, at the peony, at three dice or maniest bleaks, at the unfortunate woman, at the tables, at the fib, at Nininivinac, at the past ten, at the lurch, at one and thirty, at doublets or queen's game, at post and pair or even in sequence, at the faily, at the French trick track, at three hundred, at the long tables or fear cur or fur curing, at the unlucky man, at fell down, at the last couple in hell, at Todd's body, at the hawk, at needs must, at the surly, at the dames or drafts, at the lansquinet, at Bob and Mo, at the cuckoo, at Primus Secundus, at Puff, or let him speak that hath it, at Mark Knife, at the Keys, at Take Nothing and Throw Out, at Span Counter, at the Marriage, at Even or Odd, at the Frolic or Jackdaw, at Cross or Pile, at the Opinion, at Ball and Hucklebones, at who doth the one doth the other. At ivory balls? Did I say that? Well, at ivory balls again. At the billiards. At the sequences. At bob and hit. 
at the ivory bundles, at the owl, at the tarot, at the charming of the hare, at losing load him, at pull yet a little, at his golden esto, at trudge pig. Trudge pig. I want to know what this game is. At the torture, at the magatapes, at the hand rough, at the horn, at the click, at the flowered or shrovetide ox. At honors, at the madge owlet, at pinch without laughing, at tilt at wiki, at prickle me tickle me, at nine pins, at the unshoeing of the ass, at the cock quintin, at the cock cess, at the tip and hurl, at harry hockey, at the flat balls, at I set me down, at the veer and turn, at earl beardy, at rogue and ruffian, at the old mode, at bumbatch touch, because <laughs> I'm good at what I do, at draw the spit, at the mysterious trough, at put out, at the short bowls, at gossip lend me your sack, at the dapple gray, at the ramcod ball, at cock and crank it. Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> at th <laughs> Just give me a sec. <laughs> oh, I lost it. At thrust out the harlot. At break pot. At Marseille figs. At my desire. At Nick Namry. At twirly whirly trill. At stick and hole. At the rush bundles. At boke or him or fleeing the fox. At the short staff, at the branching it, at the whirling gig, at trill madame or grapple my lady. Hmm, that's an interesting sport. At hide and seek or all you all hid. At the cat selling, at blow the coal, at the picket, at the re-wedding, at the blank, at the quick and dead judge, at the pilferers, at unoven the iron, at the cave sun, at the false clown, at prison bars, at the flints, or at the nine stones, at have at the nuts, at to the crutch holt back, at cherry pit, at the sanct is found, at rub and rice, at hinch pinch and laugh not, at whip top, at the leak, at the casting top, at bum duck deuce, at the hob hobgoblins. At the loose gig, at the oh wonderful, at the hoop, at the soily smudgy, at the sow, at fast and loose, at belly to belly, at scutch breach. How? Wow. Okay. Well, all right, all right, all right. At the dales or straths, at the broom basom, at the twigs, at Saint Cosme, I come to adore thee. At I'm at the quoits. At I'm for that. At the lusty brown boy. At I take you for napping. Sorry, my apologies. At I take you napping. At greedy glutton. At fair and softly passeth lent. At the Morris dance. At the forked oak. At Phoebe. At truss. At the whole frisk and gamble. At the wolf's tail. At batabum or riding of the wild mare. At bum to bus or nose in breach. Uh, at Geordie, give me my lance. At hind the plowman. At swaggy waggy or shoggy shoe. At the good mockin. At stook and rook, share and threave. Shear and threave. At the dead beast. At climb the ladder, Billy. At the birch. At the dying hog. At the muss. At the salt dupe. At the dilly dilly darling. At the pretty pigeon. At Ox Moody. At Barley Break. I like Barley Break. At Purpose in Purpose. At the Bavin. At Nine Less. At the Bush Leap. At Blind Man Buff. At Crossing. At the Fallen Bridges. At Bo Peep. At Bridled Nick. At the Hardest Arse Percy. Wow. At the White at Butts. At the Harrower's Nest. At Thwack Swinge Him. At Forward Hay. At Apple Pear Plum. At The Fig. At Mumgy. At Gunshot Crack. At The Toad. At Mustard Peel. At Cricket. 
at the gom, at the pounding stick, at the relapse, at Jack and the box, at jog breach or prick him forward, at the queens, at the trades, at nog pate, at heads and points, at the cornish cho, at the vine tree hug, at the crane dance, at black be thy fall, at slash and cut, at ho the distaff, at bobbing or flirt on the nose. Well, that sounds fun. At Joan Thompson, at the bolting cloth, at the larks, at the oat seed, at philipping. I kind of feel like, well, the point of it was, to, I think the point of this up to this point was to show how useless Gargantua's training had been. So, so far, you know, he, he would wake up, he lays in bed, he'd do a bunch of disgusting bodily features, he would eat and drink a ridiculous amount, and then follow that up with so many games. And I think part of the humor, I mean, it wasn't just them filling space. It wasn't just on how play filling space. If it was just like, look how horribly useless this guy is. Look at all the stuff he's doing. And you keep going, well, come on. There can't possibly be more. But no, there is. There's at Thwack Swinge him. There's Bridled Nick. Gunshot Crack. Mustard Peel. What are these games? I don't know, but he plays them all. Hearted Hearts Percy is pretty something else. I still kind of like the notion of it being Herodotus just making a historical ledger of all the games this guy did play. Gargantua would be very popular. After he had thus well played, reveled, passed, and spent his time, it was thought fit to drink a little. <laughs> so that after, so first you drink, then you play games, and you drink some more. And that it was eleven glassfuls the man, and immediately after making good cheer again, he would stretch himself upon a fair bench or a good large bed and there sleep two or three hours together without thinking or speaking any hurt. After he was awakened, he would shake his ears a little. In the meantime, they brought him fresh wine. There he drank better than ever. Panocrates showed him that it was an ill diet to drink so after sleeping. It is, answered Gargantua, the very life of the patriarchs and holy fathers, for naturally I sleep salt, and my sleep hath been to me instead of so many gamins of bacon. Then began he to study a little, and out came the paternosters of rosaries of beads, which the better and more formally to dispatch. He got upon an old mule, which had served nine kings, and so mumbling with his mouth, nodding, nodding and dawdling his head, would go see a coney ferreted or caught in a gin. After his return, he went into the kitchen to know what roast beef was what roast meat was on the spit, and what otherwise was to be dressed for supper, and supped very well upon my conscience, and commonly did invite some of his neighbors that were good drinkers, with whom carousing and drinking merrily, they told stories of all sorts from the old to the new. Amongst others he had for domestics the lords of Fou, of Gourville, of Grignot, and of Marigny. After supper were brought in upon the place the fair wooden gospels and the books of the four kings, that is to say, many pairs of tables and cards, or the fair flush, one, two, three, or at all, to make short work, or else they went to see the wenches thereabouts, with little small banquets, intermixed with collations and rare suppers. Then did he sleep without unbridling until eight o'clock in the next morning. <laughs> so that's his academic education in a nutshell. Book 1, Chapter 23. How Gargantua was instructed by Panocrates, and in such short disciplinated... Disciplinated? Yeah, well, disciplinated. Disciplinated. There we go. That's the one. Disciplinated. That was hard. That he lost not one hour of the day. Look at him swimming. I think he's lost some of his chins. He looks to be down to about eight of them now. When Panocrates knew Gargantua's vicious manner of living, he resolved to bring him up in another kind. But for a while he bore with him, considering that nature cannot endure a sudden change without great violence. Therefore, to begin his work the better, he requested a learned physician of that time, called Master Theodorus, seriously to perpend, if it were possible, how to bring Gargantua into a better course. 
The said physician purged him canonically with antisyrian hellebore, by which medicine he cleansed all the alteration and perverse habitude of his brain. By this means also Polnocrates made him forget all that he had learned under his ancient preceptors, as Timotheus did to his disciples, who had been instructed under other musicians. To do this the better, they brought him into the company of learned men, which were there in whose imitation he had a great desire and affection to study otherwise, and to improve his parts. Afterwards, he put himself into such a road and way of studying that he lost not any one hour in the day, but employed all his time in learning and honest knowledge. Gargantua awaked, then about four o'clock in the morning, whilst they were in rubbing of him, that was read unto him some chapter of the Holy Scripture aloud and clearly, with a pronunciation fit for the matter, and hereunto was appointed a young page born in Basque, named Anag well, Anagnostes. According to the purpose and argument of that lesson, he oftentimes gave himself to worship, adore, pray, and set up his supplications to that good God, whose word did show his majesty and marvelous judgment. Then went he unto the secret places to make excretion of his natural digestions. There his master repeated what had been read, expounding unto him the most obscure and difficult points. In returning, they considered the face of the sky, if it was such as they had observed it the night before, and into what signs the sun was entering, as also the moon for that day. This done, he was apparelled, combed, curled, trimmed, and perfumed, during which time they repeated to him the lessons of the day before. He himself said them by heart, and upon them would ground some practical cases concerning the estate of man, which he would prosecute sometimes two or three hours, but ordinarily they ceased as soon as he was fully clothed. Then for three good hours he had a lecture read unto him. This done, they went forth, still conferring of the substance of the lecture, either unto a field near the university called the Brack, or unto the meadows, where they played at the ball, the long tennis, and at the Pilitrigon, which is a play wherein we throw a triangular piece of iron at a ring to pass it, most gallantly exercising their bodies, as formerly they had done their minds. All their play was but in liberty, for they left off when they pleased, and that was commonly when they did sweat all over their body, or were otherwise weary. Then they were very well wiped and rubbed, shifted their shirts, and walking soberly, went to see if dinner was ready. Whilst they stayed for that, they did clearly and eloquently pronounce some sentences that they had retained of the lecture. In the meantime, Master Appetite came, and then very orderly sat they down at table. At the beginning of the meal, there was read some pleasant history of the warlike actions of former times, until he had taken a glass of wine. Then, if they were thought good, they continued reading, or began to discourse merrily together, speaking first of the virtue, propriety, efficacy, and nature of all that was served in at the table, of bread, of wine, of water, of salt, of fleshes, fishes, fruits, herbs, roots, and of their dressing. By means whereof he learned in a little time all the passages competent for this that were to be bound in Pliny, Athenaeus, Dioscorides, Julius Pollux, Galen, Porphyry, Opian, Polybius, Heliodor, Aristotle, Aelian, and others. Whilst they talked of these things many times, to be the more certain, they caused the very books to be brought to the table, and so well and perfectly did he in his memory retain the things above said, that in that time there was not a physician that knew half so much as he did. Afterwards they conferred of the lessons read in the morning, and, ending their repast with some conserve or marmalade of quinces, he picked his teeth with mastic toothpickers, washed his hands and eyes with a fair fresh water, and gave thanks unto God in some fine cantiques, made in praise of the divine bounty and munificence. This done, they brought in cards, not to play, but to learn a thousand pretty tricks and new inventions, which were all grounded upon arithmetic. Arithmetic. By this means he fell in love with that numerical science, and every day after dinner and supper he passed his time in it as pleasantly as he was wont to do at cards and dice, so that at last he understood so well both of the theory and practical part thereof, 
that Tunstall the Englishman, who had written very largely of that purpose, confessed that verily in comparison of him he had no skill at all. And not only in that, but in the other mathematical sciences, as geometry, astronomy, music, etc. For in waiting on the concoction and attending the digestion of his food, they made a thousand pretty instruments and geometrical figures, and did in some measure practice the astronomical canons. After this, they recreated, themsel they recreated themselves with singing musically, in four or five parts, or upon a set theme or ground at random, as it best pleased them. In, manner, in matter of musical instruments, he learned to play upon the lute, the virginals, the harp, the alme flute with nine holes, the viol, and the sackbut. Well, that's cool. This hour thus spent, and digestion finished, he did purge his body of natural excrements, then betook himself to his principal study for three hours together, or more, as well to repeat his matutinal lectures as to proceed in the book wherein he was, as also to write handsomely, to draw and form the antique and Roman letters. This being done, they went out of their house, and with them a young gentleman of Touraine, named the Esquire Gymnast, who taught him the art of riding. Changing then his clothes, he rode a Naples courser, a Dutch Roussin, a Spanish genet, a barded or trapped steed, and then a light fleet horse, unto whom he gave a hundred carriers, made him go the high salts, bounding in the air, free the ditch with a skip, leap over a stile or pail, turn short in a ring both to the right and left hand. There he broke not his lance, for it is the greatest foolery in the world to say, I have broken ten lances at tilts or in fight. A carpenter can even do as much. But it is a glorious and praiseworthy action with one lance to break and overthrow ten enemies. Therefore, with a sharp, stiff, strong, and well-steeled lance, he would usually force up a door, pierce a harness, beat down a tree, carry away the ring, lift up a cuirassier saddle with the mail coat and gauntlet. All this he did in complete arms from head to foot. As for the prancing flourishes and smacking popisms for the better cherishing of the horse commonly used in riding, none did them better than he. The Cavalleries of Ferrara was but as an ape compared to him. He was singularly skillful in leaping nimbly from one horse to another without putting foot to ground, and these horses were called desultories. He could likewise from either side, with a lance in his hand, leap on horseback without stirrups, and rule the horse at his pleasure without a bridle, for such things are useful in military engagements. Another day he exercised the battle-axe, which he so dexterously wielded, both in the nimble, strong, and smooth management of that weapon, and that in all the feats practical by it, that he passed a knight of arms in the field and at all essays. Yeah, the sack butt, I, I remember actually seeing a sack butt, but I don't remember much about it, but it had a really peculiar sound. Still, I kind of like that sort of instrument. Then he toss, then tossed he the pike, played with the two-handed sword, with the back sword, with the Spanish tuck, the dagger, poniard, armed, unarmed, with a buckler, with a cloak, with a target. Then he would hunt the heart, the roebuck, the bear, the fallow deer, the wild boar, the hare, the pheasant, the partridge, and the bustard. He played at the balloon and made it bound in the air, both with fist and foot. He wrestled, ran, jumped, not at three steps and a leap, called the hops, nor at cloche pied, called the hare's leap, nor yet at the alme, for, said gymnast, these jumps are for the wars altogether unprofitable and of no use. But at one leap he would skip over a ditch, spring over a hedge, mount six paces upon a wall, ramp and grapple after this fashion up against a window of the full height of a lance. He did swim in deep waters on his belly, on his back, sideways, with all his body, with his feet only, with one hand in the air, wherein he held a book, crossing thus the breadth of the river of Seine without wetting it, and dragged along his cloak with his teeth, as did Julius Caesar, then with the help of one hand he forcibly whoa, then with the help of one hand he entered forcibly into a boat, from whence he cast himself again headlong into the water, sounded the depths, hollowed the rocks, and plunged in, plunged into the pits and gulfs. Then turned he the boat about, governed it, 
led it swiftly or slowly with the stream and against the stream, stopped it in his course, guided it with one hand, and with the other laid hard about him with a huge great oar, hoisted the sail, hide up along the masts by the shrouds, ran along the edge of the docks, set the compass in order, tackled the bowlines, and steered the helm. Coming out of the water, he ran furiously up against a hill, and with the same alacrity and swiftness ran down again. He climbed up at trees like a cat, and leaped from one to the other like a squirrel. He did pull down the great bows and branches like another Milo. Then, with two sharp, well-steeled daggers and two tried bodkins, he would run up by the wall to the very top of a house like a rat, then suddenly come down from the top to the bottom, with such an even composition of members that by the fall he would catch no harm. <laughs> He's not done yet, man. We... He is not done the day yet. We still probably have another six hours to go. He did cast the dart, throw the bar, put the stone, practice the javelin, the boar spear or partisan, and the halbert. He broke the strongest bows in drawing, bent it against his breast, the greatest crossbows of steel, took his aim by the eye with the handgun, and shot well, traversed and planted the cannon, shot at butt marks at the pap gave from the below upwards, or to a height from the above downwards, or to a descent, then before him, sideways, and behind him, like the Parthians. They tied a cable rope to the top of a high tower, by one end whereof, hanging near the ground, he wrought himself with his hands to the very top, then upon the same track came down so sturdily and firm that you could not on a plain meadow have run with more assurance. They set up a great pole fixed upon two trees. There he would hang by his hands, and with them alone, his feet touching at nothing, would go back and forth along the foresaid rope with so great swiftness that hardly one could overtake him with running. And then, to exercise his breast and lungs, he would shout like all the devils in hell. I heard him once call Eudemon from St. Victor's Gate to Montmartre. Stentor had never such a voice at the Siege of Troy. Then, for the strengthening of his nerves or sinews, they made him two great sows of lead, each of them weighing eight hundred and seven, eight thousand and seven hundred quintals, which they called altars. Those he took up from the ground, in each hand one, then lifted them up over his head, and held them so without stirring three quarters of an hour and more, which was an inimitable force. He fought at barriers with the stoutest and most vigorous champions, and when it came to the cope, he stood so sturdily on his feet that he abandoned himself unto the strongest, in case they could remove him from his place, as Milo was wont to do of old, in whose imitation, likewise, he held a pomegranate in his hand, to give it unto him that could take it from him. The time being thus bestowed, and himself rubbed, cleansed, wiped, and refreshed with other clothes, he returned fair and softly and passing through certain meadows, or other grassy places, beheld the trees and plants, comparing them with what is written of them in the books of the ancients, such as Theophrast, Dioscorides, Marinus, Pliny, Nicander, Macer, and Galen, and carried home to the house great handfuls of them, whereof a young page named Rizotomos had charge, together with little mattocks, pickaxes, grubbing hooks, cabbies, pruning knives, and other instruments requisite for herborizing. Being come to their lodging, whilst supper was making ready, they repeated certain passages of that which hath been read, and sat down to table. Here remark, that his dinner was sober and thrifty, for he did then eat only to prevent the nongs of his stomach, but his supper was copious and large, for he took then as much was fit to maintain and nourish him, which indeed is the true diet prescribed by the art of good and sound physic. Although a rabble of logger-headed physicians, nuzzled in the brabbling shop of sophisters, counsel the contrary. During that repast was continued the lesson read to him, read at dinner as long as they thought good. The rest was spent in good discourse, learned and profitable. After that, they had given thanks. He set himself to sing vocally and play upon harmonious instruments, or otherwise passed his time at some pretty sports, made with cards or dice, or in practicing the feats of la jardinier with cups and larger de main, sorry, with cups and balls. There they stayed some nights in frolicking thus, and making themselves merry till it was time to go to bed. And on other nights they would go make visits unto learned men, 
or to such as had been travelers in strange and remote countries. When it was full night, before they retired themselves, they went unto the most open place of the house to see the face of the sky, and there beheld the comets, if any were, as likewise the figures, situations, aspects, oppositions, and conjunctions of both the fixed stars and planets. Then with his master did he briefly recapitulate after the manner of the Pythagoreans, that which he had read, seen, learned, done, and understood in the whole course of the day. Then prayed they unto God the Creator, and falling down before him, and strengthening their faith towards him, and glorifying him for his boundless bounty, and giving thanks unto him for the time that was past, they recommended themselves to his divine clemency for the future. Which being done, they went to bed, and betook themselves to their repose and rest. <laughs> yeah, I think you got that. It was definitely Rabelais. That was a first, that was a training montage and a half. Wow, and um, okay, I was just trying to to and so to bed. Yeah, like they had enough time for like an hour of sleep, maybe if they were lucky. Whew. Book one, chapter twenty four. How Gargantua spent his time in rainy weather. Oops. Hello. If it happened that the weather were anything cloudy, foul, and rainy, all the forenoon was employed, as before specified, according to custom, with this difference only, that they had a good clear fire lighted to correct the distempers of the air. But after dinner, instead of their wanted exercitations, they did abide within, and by way of apotherapy, that is, making the body healthful by exercise, did recreate themselves in bottling up of hay, in cleaving and sawing of wood, and in threshing sheaves of corn at the barn. Then they studied the art of painting or carving, or brought into use the antique play of tables, as Leonicus had, hath written of it, and as our good friend Lascaris playeth at it. In playing they examined the passages of ancient authors wherein the said play is mentioned, or any metaphor drawn from it. They went likewise to see the drawing of metals, or the casting of great ordnance, how the lapidaries did work, as also the goldsmiths and cutters of precious stones. Nor did they omit to visit the alchemists, money coiners, upholsterers, weavers, velvet workers, watchmakers, looking glass framers, printers, organists, and other such kind of artificers, and everywhere giving them somewhat to drink, did learn and consider the industry and invention of the trades. They went also to hear the public lectures, the solemn commencements, the repetitions, the acclamations, the pleadings of the gentle lawyers, and sermons of the evangelical preachers. He went through the halls and places appointed for fencing, and there played against the masters themselves at all weapons, and showed them by experience that he knew as much in it as, yea, more than they. And instead of herborizing, they visited the shops of druggists, herbalists, and apothecaries, and diligently, diligently considered the fruits, roots, leaves, gums, seeds, the grease, and ointments of some foreign parts, as also how they did adulterate them. He went to see the jugglers, tumblers, mountebanks, and quack salvers, and considered their cunning, their shifts, their somersaults, and smooth tongue, especially those of Shawnee and Picardy who are naturally great praters and brave givers of fibs in matter of green apes. At their return, they did eat more soberly at supper than at other times, and meats more desiccative and extenuating, to the end that the intemperate moisture of the air, communicated to the body by a necessary confinitive, might by this means be corrected, and that they might not receive any prejudice for want of their ordinarily bodily exercise. Thus was Gargantua governed and kept on this course of education from day to day profiting, as you may understand such a young man of his age may, of a pregnant judgment, with good discipline well continued, which, although at the beginning it seemed difficult, became a little easier, sorry, became a little after so sweet, so easy, and so delightful, that it seemed rather the recreation of a king than the study of a scholar. Nevertheless, Panocrates, to divert him from this vehement intention of the spirits, thought fit, once in a month, upon some fair and clear day, to go out of the city betimes in the morning, either towards Gentilly, or Boulogne, or Montrouge, or Chantaron Bridge, 
or to Vanv or St. Cloud, and there spend all the day long in making the greatest cheer that could be devised, sporting, making merry, drinking healths, playing, singing, dancing, tumbling in some fair meadow, unnestling of sparrows, taking of quails, and fishing for frogs and crabs. But although that day was passed without books or lecture, yet it was not spent without profit. For in the said meadows they usually repeated certain pleasant verses of Vigil's agriculture, of Hesiod and of Politian's husbandry, which set abroad some witty latty epigrams, then immediately turned them into roundelays and songs for dancing in the French language. In their feasting, they would sometimes separate the water from the wine that was therewith mixed as Cato teethish, teacheth the dairy rustica, and Pliny with an ivy cup would wash the wine in a basin full of water, then take it out again with a funnel as pure as ever. They made the water go from one glass to another and contrived a thousand little automatory engines, that is to say, moving of themselves. <laughs> uh, you can probably see where the, uh, and I'm going to just jiggle my mouse nearby, where the, uh, the scroll bar is. Gargantuous got a lot more things to do. A lot. All right. Book one. Chapter 25. How there was great strife and debate raised betwixt the cake bakers of Laren and those of Gargantua's country, whereupon were waged great wars. At that time, which was the season of vintage, in the beginning of harvest, when the country shepherds were set to keep the vines and hinder the starlings from eating up the grapes, as some cake bakers of Laren happened to pass along the broad highway, driving into the city ten or twelve horses loaded with cakes. The said shepherds courteously entreated them to give them some for their money, as the price then ruled in the market. For here it is to be remarked that it is a celestial food to eat for breakfast hot, fresh cakes with grapes, especially the, f especially the frail clusters, the great red grapes, the muscadine, the verjuice grape, and the lasgard for those that are costive in their belly, because it will make them gush out and squirt the length of a hunter's staff, like the very top of a barrel. And oftentimes, thinking to let a squib, they did all to be squatter and conskite themselves, whereupon they are commonly called the vintage thinkers. The bun sellers, or cake makers, were nothing inclinable to their request, but, which was worse, did injure them most outrageously, calling them prattling gabblers, Licorice gluttons, freckled biters, or maybe bitters, mangy, mangy rascals, shite bed scoundrels, drunken roisters, sly knaves, drowsy loiterers, slap sauce fellows. Oh, I love this one. Slabber de Gullian druggles, lubberly louts, cozening foxes, ruffian rogues, paltry customers, sycophant farlands. Draw latch hoydens, flouting milksops, jeering companions, staring clowns, forlorn snakes, ninny lobcocks, scurvy sneaks bees, fondling fops, base loons, soxy coxcombs, excuse me, idle lusks, scoffing braggarts, naughty beacocks, blockish grutnals, dodipal jolt heads, jobbernal goose caps, foolish loggerheads, flutch calf lollies, Grout head, gnat snappers, that's a good one. Lob dotterels, gaping changelings, cock's head, lubies, woodcock slangums, ninny hammer flycatchers, naughty peak simpletons, turdy gut, shitten shepherds, and others such like defamatory epithets. I'd say they had some feelings about this. Saying further, it was not for them to eat of these dainty cakes, but might very well content themselves with the coarse unranged bread or to eat of the great brown household loaf. To which provoking words, one amongst them called Forgier, an honest fellow of his person, and a notable spring all, made answer very calmly thus. How long is it since you have got horns, that you are become, that you are become so proud? Indeed, formerly, you were wont to give us some freely. And will you not, and will you not now let us have any for our money? This is not the part of good neighbors, neither do we serve you thus when you come hither to buy our good corn, whereof you make your cakes and buns. Besides that, we would have given you to the bargain some of our grapes, but by his zounds you may chance to repent it, and possibly have need of us at another time, when we shall use you after the like manner, and therefore remember it. 
Then Marquet, a prime man in the confraternity of the cake bakers, said unto him, Yea, sir, thou art pretty well crest risen this morning. Thou didst eat yesternight too much millet and bollymong. Come hither, Sarah, come hither, I will give thee some cakes. Whereupon Forgier, dreading no harm, in all simplicity went towards him, and drew a sixpence out of his leather satchel, thinking that Marquet would have sold him some of his cakes. But uh, instead of cakes, he gave with him... Wow, let me try this again. I'm tripping over my own tongue. But instead of cakes, he gave him with his whip such a rude lash overthwart the legs that the marks of the whipcord knots were apparent in them. And then would have fled away, but Forgier cried out as loud as he could, Oh, murder, murder, help, help, help! And in the meantime threw a great cudgel after him, after which he carried under his arm, wherewith he hit him in the coronal joint of his head, upon the crotaphic artery of the right side thereof, so forcibly that Marquet fell down from his mare more like a dead than living man. Meanwhile, the farmers and country swains that were watching their walnuts leer to that place came running with their great poles and long staves, and laid such a load on these cake bakers that as if they had been to thresh upon green rye. The other shepherds and shepherdesses, hearing the lamentable shout of Forgier, came up with their slings and slackies following them, and throwing great stones at them as thick as if it had been hail. At last they overtook them, and took from them about four or five dozen of their cakes. Nevertheless, they paid for them the ordinary price, and gave them over and above one hundred eggs and three baskets full of mulberries. Then did the cake bakers help to get up to his mare, Marquet, who was most shrewdly wounded, and forthwith returned to learn, changing the resolution they had to go to Paris, threatening very sharp and boisterously the cowherds, shepherds, and farmers of Seville and Sine. This done, the shepherds and shepherdesses made merry with these cakes and fine grapes, and sported themselves together at the sound of the pretty small pipe, scoffing and laughing at those vainglorious cake bakers, who had that day met with a mischief for want of crossing themselves with a good hand in the morning. Nor did they forget to apply to Forgier's leg some fair great red medicinal grapes, and so handsomely dressed it and bound it up that he was quickly cured. Man, those insults, though, those were some really good ones. Book 1, Chapter 26 How the Inhabitants of Lern, by the commandment of Pricochol their king, assaulted the shepherds of Gargantua unexpectedly and on a sudden. The cake bakers, being returned to learn, went presently before they did either eat or drink to the capital, and there before their king, called Picrochol, the third of that name, made their complaint, showing their panniers broken, their caps all crumpled, their courts torn, their cakes taken away, but above all, Marquet most enormously wounded, saying that all the mischief was done by the shepherds and herdsmen of Grand Goussier, near the broad highway beyond Seville. Picachol incontinent grew angry and furious, and without asking any further what, how, why, or wherefore, commanded the ban and arriere ban to be sounded throughout all his country, and that all his vassals of what condition soever should, upon pain of the halter, come in the best arms they could unto the great place before the castle at the hour of noon, and, the better to strengthen his design, he caused the drum to be beat about the town himself, whilst his dinner was making ready, went to see his artillery mounted upon the carriage, to display his colours, and set up by the great royal standard, and loaded wains with store of ammunition both for the field and the belly, arms and victuals. At dinner he dispatched his commissions, and by his express edict my lord Shagrag was appointed to command the vanguard, wherein were numbered sixteen thousand and fourteen arquebusiers or firelocks, together with 30,011 volunteer adventurers. Their great Tuc Dion, master of the horse, had the charge of the ordnance, wherein was reckoned 914 brazen pieces in cannons, double cannons, basilisks, serpentines, culverins, bombards or murderers, falcons, bases or passe-volets, spirals, and other sorts of great guns. The rearguard was committed to the Duke of Scrapegood, in the main battle was the king and the princes of his kingdom. Thus being hastily furnished, before they would set forward, 
they sent 300 light horsemen under the conduct of Captain Swillwind to discover the country, clear the avenues, and see whether there was any ambush laid for him. But after they had made diligent search, they found all the land round about in peace and quiet, without any meeting or convention at all, which Prikoshol understanding commanded that everyone should march speedily under his colors. Then immediately, in all disorder, without keeping either rank or file, they took the fields one amongst another, wasting, spoiling, destroying, and making havoc of all wherever they went, not sparing poor nor rich, privileged or unprivileged places, church nor laity, drove away oxen and cows, bulls, calves, heifers, weathers, ewes, lambs, goats, kins, hens, capons, chickens, geese, ganders, goslings, hogs, swine, pigs, and such like, beating down the walnuts, plucking the grapes, tearing the hedges, shaking the fruit trees, and committing such incomprehensible abuses that the like abomination was never heard of. Nevertheless, they met with none to resist them, for everyone submitted to their mercy, beseeching them that they might be dealt with courteously in regard that they had always carried themselves as become good and loving neighbors, and that they had never been guilty of any wrong or outrage done to them, to be thus suddenly surprised, troubled, and disquieted, and that, if they would not desist, God would punish them very shortly. To which expostulations and remonstrances no other answer was made, but that they should teach... To which exp postulations and remonstrances no other answer was made but that they would teach them to eat cakes huh. oh i'm not used to seeing monks that chubby i guess chapter 20 sorry book one chapter 27 how a monk of seville saved the clothes of the abbey from being ransacked by the enemy so much they did, and so far went the pillaging and stealing, that at last they came to Seville, where they robbed both men and women, and they took all they could catch. Nothing was either too hot or too heavy for them. Although the plague was there in the most part of all the houses, they nevertheless entered everywhere, then plundered and carried away all that was within, and yet for all this not one of them took any hurt, which is a most wonderful case. For the curates, vicars, preachers, physicians, chirurgeons, and apothecaries, who went to visit, to dress, to cure, to heal, to preach unto, and admonish those that were sick, were all dead of the infection. And these devilish robbers and murderers caught never any harm at all. Whence comes this to pass, my masters? I beseech you to think upon it. The town being thus pillaged, they went unto the abbey with a horrible noise and tumult, but they found it shut and made fast against them whereupon the body of the army marched forward toward a pass or ford called Gudeved, except seven companies of foot and two hundred lancers, who, staying there, broke down the walls of the close to waste, spoil, and make havoc of all the vines and vintage within that place. The monks, poor devils, knew not in that extremity to which of all their sanctes they should vow themselves. Nevertheless, at all adventures they rang the bells ad capitulum capitulantes, there it was decreed that they should make a fair procession, stuffed with good lectures, prayers, and litanies, contra hostium insidias, and jolly responses pro passe. There was then in the abbey a claustral monk called Friar John of the Funnels and Gobbets, in French des Antumères, young, gallant, frisk, lusty, nimble, quick, active, bold, adventurous, resolute, tall, lean, wide-mouthed, long-nosed, a fair dispatcher of morning prayers, unbridler of masses, and runner over of vigils, and, to conclude summarily in a word, a right monk, if ever there was any, since the monking world monked a monkery. For the rest, a clerk even to the teeth in matters of breviary. This monk, hearing the noise that the enemy made within the enclosure of the vineyard, went out to see what they were doing, and perceiving that they were cutting and gathering the grapes, whereon was grounded the foundation of all their next year's wine, returned unto the choir of the church, where all the monks were, all amazed and astonished like so many bell-melters. Whom, when he heard sing, Im nim pi ni 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 neni tum ni num num ni ka blah 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 blah, it is well shit, well sung, said he. By the virtue of God, why do you not sing, panniers? Farewell, the vintage is done. <laughs> The devil snatch me, if they not 
if they be not already within the middle of our close, and cut so well both grape vine and grapes that, by Cod's body, there will not be found for these four years to come so much as a gleaning in it. By the belly of St. James, what shall we poor devils drink the while? Lord God, damihi potum, then said the prior of the convent. What should this drunken fellow do here? Let him be carried to prison for troubling the divine service. Nay, said the monk, the wine service. Let us behave ourselves so that it be not troubled. For you yourself, my lord prior, love to drink of the best, and so doth every honest man. Yet never yet did a man of worth dislike a good wine. It is a monastical apotheum. But these responses that you chant here by G are not in season. Wherefore is it that our devotions were instituted to be short in the time of harvest and vintage, and long in the advent, and all the winter? The late friar, Massa Pelas, of good memory, a true zealous man, or else I give myself to the devil, of our religion, told me. And I remember it well, how the, se how the reason was, that in this season we might press and make the wine, and in winter whiff it up. Hark you, my masters, that y you that love the wine, cop's body, Follow me, for St. Anthony burn me as freely as a faggot, if they get leave to taste one drop of the liquor that will not now come and fight for the relief of the wine. Hog's belly, the goods of the church. Ha, no, no, what the devil, St. Thomas of England was well content to die for them. If I died in the same cause, should I not be a saint likewise? Yes, yet shall not I die here for all this, for it is that I must do it to others and send them a packing. As he spake this, he threw off his great monk's habit and laid hold upon the staff of the cross, which was made of the heart of the sorb apple tree, it being the length of a lance, round, of a full grip, and a little powdered with lilies called fleur de, flower de luce, the workmanship whereof was almost all defaced and worn out. Thus he went out in a fairly long skirted jacket, putting his frock scarf-wise athwart his breast, and this in this equipage, with a staff, shaft, or truncheon of the cross, laid on so lustily, brisk, and fiercely upon his enemies, who, without any order or ensign or trumpet or drum, were busied in the gathering the grapes of the vineyard. For the cornets, guidons, and ensign bearers had laid down their standards, banners, and colors by the wall sides. The drummers had knocked out the heads of the drums on one end to fill them with grapes. The trumpeters were loaded with great bundles of bunches and huge knots of clusters. In some, Every one of them was out of array and in and all in disorder. He hurried, therefore, upon them so rudely, without crying Gar or Beware, that he overthrew them like hogs, tumbled them over like swine, striking a thwart on a longst, and by one means or other laid so about him, after the old fashion of fencing, that to some he beat out their brains, to others he crushed their arms, battered their legs, and bethwacked their sides till their ribs cracked with it. To others, again, he unjointed the spondils or knuckles of the neck, disfigured their chaps, gashed their faces, made their cheeks hang flapping on their chin, and so swinged and balamed them that they all f they fell down before him like hay before a mower. To some others, he spoiled the frame of their kidneys, marred their backs, broke their thigh bones, pashed in their noses, poached out their eyes, cleft their mandibles, tore their jaws, dung in their dung in their teeth into their throat, shook asunder their omoplats or shoulder blades, sfacelated their shins, mortified their shanks, inflamed their ankles, heaved off the hinges, their ischies, their sciatica or hip gout, dislocated the joints of their knees, squattered into pieces the boats or pestles of their thighs, and so thumped, mauled, and belabored them everywhere that never was corn so thick and threefold threshed upon by the plowman's fails as were the pitifully disjointed members of their mangled bodies under the merciless baton of the cross. If any offered to hide himself amongst the thickest of the, th of the vines, he laid him squat as a flounder, bruised the ridge of his back, and dashed his reins like a dog. If any thought to flight by if any thought by flight to escape, he made his head fly to pieces by the lamboidal commissure, which is a seam in the hinder part of the skull. If any did scramble up into a tree, thinking there to be safe, he rent up his perine Oh my god! He rent up his perine and impaled him in at the fundament. 
if any of his old acquaintance happened to cry out, Ha! Friar John! My friend Friar John! Quarter! Quarter! I yield myself to you! To you I render myself! So thou shalt, said he, and must, whether thou wouldst or no, and withal render and yield up thy soul to all the devils in hell. Then suddenly gave them dronos, that is, so many knocks, thumps, raps, dints, thwacks, and bangs, as sufficed to warn Pluto of their coming and dispatch them a-going. If any was so rash and full of temerity as to resist him to his face, then it was, then was it he who did show, wah, then was it he did show the strength of his muscles. For without more ado, he did transpierce them by running him in at the breast through the mediastine and the heart. Others again, he so quashed and bebumped that without a sound bounce under the hollow of their short ribs, he overturned their stomachs so that they died immediately. To some, with a smart souse on the epigaster, he would make their midriff swag, then, redoubling the blow, gave them such a home push on the, novel, on the navel that he made their puddings gush out. To others, through their ballocks, he pierced their bum gut and left not bowel, tripe, nor entrail in their body that had not felt the impetuosity, fierceness, and fury of his violence. Believe that it was the most horrible spectacle that one ever saw. Some cried unto Saint Barbed, others to Saint George. Oh, the holy night touch, said one. Oh, the good Sanctus. Oh, our lady of succors, said another. Help, help. Others cried, Our lady of Cunaut, of Loretto, of good tidings. On the other side of the water, Saint Mary over. Some vowed a, pri a pilgrimage to Saint James, and others to the holy handkerchief at Chambury, which three months after that burnt so well into the fire that they could not get one thread of it saved. Others sent up their vows to St. Cadouin, others to St. John d'Angely, to St. Eutropius of Shanks. Others again invoked St. Mesmus of Chinot, St. Martin, Martin of Candes, St. Clouot of Sinais, the holy relic of Lorise, with a thousand other jolly little saints and sandrals. Some died without speaking, others spoke without dying, some died in speaking, others spoke in dying. Others shouted as loud as they could, Confession! Confession! Confiteor! Miserare in menace! So great was the cry of the wounded that the prior of the abbey with all his monks came forth, who, when they saw those poor wretches so slain among the vines and wounded to death, confessed some of them. But whilst the priests were busy in confessing them, the little monkeys ran all to the place where Friar John was and asked him wherein he would be pleased to require their assistance. Whew. <laughs> yeah, seriously. To which he answered that they should cut the throats of those he had thrown down upon the ground. They presently, leaving their outer habits and cowls upon the rails, began to throttle and make an end of those whom he had already crushed. Can you tell with what instruments they did it? With fair gullies, which are little hulch-backed demi-knives, the iron tool whereof is two inches long, and the wooden handle one inch thick and three inches in length, wherewith the little boys in our country cut ripe walnuts in two while they are yet in the shell, and pick out the kernel. And they found them very fit for the expediting of that wizant slitting exploit. In the meantime, Friar John, with his formidable baton of the cross, got to the breach which the enemies had made, and there stood to snatch up those that endeavored to escape. Some of the monkitos carried the standards, banners, ensigns, guidon, and color into their cells and chambers to make garters of them. But when those had been shriven, would have gone out at the gap of the said breach, the sturdy monk quashed and felled them down with blows, saying, These men have had confession and are penitent souls. They have got their absolution and gained their pardons. They go into paradise as straight as a sickle, or as the way is to fay, like Crooked Lane at East Cheap. Thus, by his prowess and valor, were discomforted all those of the army that entered into the close of the abbey, unto the number of thirteen thousand six hundred twenty and two, besides the women and little children, which is always to be understood. Never did Mogi, or Moji, the hermit, bear himself more violently with his bourdon or pilgrim staff against the Saracens, of whom is written in the Acts of the Four Sons of Amo, than did this monk against his enemies with the staff of the cross. And as an aside, had the Vikings gone after the monks' vineyards instead of their um, manuscripts, would have been an entirely different story.
Wow, that was a that was a kind of macabre journey as well. Book one, chapter twenty eight. How Picrochol stormed and took by assault the rock Clermont, and of Gragusia's unwillingness and aversion from the undertaking of war. <laughs> exactly. Whilst the monk did thus skirmish, as we have said, against those which were entered into the close, Picrochol, Picrochol in great haste passed the ford of Ved, a very special pass, with all his soldiers, and set upon the rock Clermont where there was made him no resistance at all, and because it was already night, he resolved to quarter himself and his army in that town, and to refresh himself of his pugnative collar. In the morning he stormed and took the bulwarks and castle, af which afterwards he fortified with rampiers, and furnished with all ammunition requisite, intending to make his retreat there, if he should happen to be otherwise rout worsted for it was a strong place both by art and nature, in regard of the stance and situation of it. But let us leave them there, and return to our good Gargantua, who is at Paris very assiduous and earnest at the study of good letters and athletical exercitations, and to the good man Gragusier his father, who after supper warmeth his bollocks by a good clear great fire, and waiting upon the broiling of some chestnuts, is very serious in drawing scratches upon the earth, the hearth, with a stick burnt at one end, wherewith they did stir up the fire, telling to his wife and the rest of the family pleasant old stories and tales of former times. Whilst he was thus employed, one of the shepherds which did keep the vines, named Pio, came towards him, and to the full related the enormous abuses which were committed, and the excessive spoil that was made by P Picrochol, king of Laren, upon his lands and territories and how he had pillaged, wasted, and ransacked all the country, except the enclosure at Seville, which Friar John de, de Zantumer, to his great honor, had preserved, and that at the same present time the said king was in the Rock Clermont, and there, with great industry and circumspection, was strengthening himself and his whole army. Halas, halas, alas, said Grangousier, what is this, good people? Do I dream, or is it true that they tell me? Picrochol, my ancient friend of old time, of my own kindred and alliance, comes he to invade me? What moves him? What provokes him? What sets him on? What drives him to it? Who hath given him this counsel? Ho, 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 my God, my Savior, help me, inspire me, and advise me what I should do. I protest, I swear before thee, so be thou favorable to me, if ever I did him or his subjects any damage or displeasure, or committed any the least robbery in his country, but on the contrary, I have succored and supplied him with men, money, friendship, and counsel, upon any occasion where I could be steadable for the improvement of his good. That he hath therefore at this nick of time so outraged and wronged me, it cannot be but by the malevolent and, mal and wicked spirit. Good God! Thou knowest my courage, for nothing can be hidden from thee. If perhaps he be grown mad, and that thou hast sent hither to me for the better recovery and re-establishment of his brain, grant me power and wisdom to bring him to the yoke of thy holy will by good discipline. Ho, 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 my good people, my friends and my faithful servants, must I hinder you from helping me? Alas, my old age required henceforward nothing else but rest, and all the days of my life I have labored for nothing so much as peace. But now I must, I see it well, load my arms with my poor, weary, and feeble soldiers, and take in my trembling hand the lance and horseman's mace to succor and protect my honest subjects. Reason will have it so, for by their labor am I entertained, and with their sweat am I nourished, I, my children, and my family. This notwithstanding, I will not undertake war until I have first tried all the ways and means of peace that I resolve upon. Then assembled he his council, and proposed the matter as it was indeed, whereupon it was concluded that they should send some discreet man unto Picrochol, to know wherefore he had thus suddenly broken the peace and invaded those lands unto which he had no right nor title. Furthermore, that they should send for Gargantua, and those under his command for the preservation of the country and defense thereof now at need. All this pleased Grangousier very well, and he commanded that so it should be done. Presently, therefore, 
he sent the Basque his lackey to fetch Gargantua with all diligence and wrote him as followeth. Whew. Ch Book 1, Chapter 29. The tenor of the letter which Grangousier wrote to his son Gargantua. The fervency of thy studies did require that I should not in a long time recall thee from that philosophical rest thou not... Thou not... Wow, that's hard. From that philosophical rest thou now enjoyest, if the confidence reposed in our friends and ancient confederates had not at this present disappointed the assurance of my old age. But seeing such is my fatal destiny, that I should be now disquieted by those in whom I trusted most, I am forced to call thee back to help the people and goods which by the right of nature belong unto thee. For even as arms are weak abroad, if there be not counsel at home, so is that study vain and counsel unprofitable, which in a due and convenient time is not by virtue executed and put into effect. My deliberation is not to provoke, but to appease, not to assault, but to defend, not to conquer, but to preserve my faithful subjects and hereditary domains, into which Pricochol is entered in a hostile manner without any ground or cause, and from day to day pursueth his furious enterprise with that height of insolence that is intolerable to freeborn spirits. I have endeavored to moderate his tyrannical choler, offering him all that which I had thought might give him satisfaction, and oftentimes have I lovingly sent unto him to understand wherein, by whom, and how he found himself to be wronged. But of him could I obtain no other answer but a mere defiance, and that in my lands he did he blah, blah, blah. And that in my lands he did pretend only to the right of a civil correspondency and good behavior, whereby I knew that the eternal God hath left him to the disposure of his own free will and sensual appetite, which cannot choose but be wicked if by divine grace it be not continually guided. And to contain him within his duty and bring him to know himself hath sent him hither to me by a grievous token. Therefore, my beloved son, as soon as thou canst, upon sight of these letters, repair hither with all diligence, to succor not me so much, which nevertheless by natural piety thou oughtest to do, as thine own people, which by reason thou mayest save and preserve. The exploit shall be done with as little effusion of blood as may be, and, if possible, by means far more expedient such as military policy, devices, and stratagems of war, we shall save all the souls and send them home as merry as crickets unto their own houses. My dearest son, the peace of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, be with thee. Salute from me, Panocrates, Gymnastes, and Eudemon. The 20th September, thy father, Garangusier. Oh, great. So our weather is completely insane. Chapter 1, Book 13. <laughs> uh, who knows? I'm Actually, we'll, we'll see how it turns out, right? I, I, literally, I could not tell you. Chapter 1, Book 30. Our Book 1, Chapter 30. Anyway, 130. How Ulrich Gallet, or Gaillet, was set unto a precursor. The letters being dictated, signed, and sealed, Grangousier ordained that Ulrich Gaillet, master of their quests, a very wise and discreet man, of whose prudence and sound judgment he had made him he had made trial in several difficult and debateful matters, should go unto Picrochol to show what had been decreed amongst them. At the same hour departed the good man Gallet, because I guess his name is Ulrich, he's not French, and having passed the ford, asked at the miller that dwelt there in what condition Picrochol was, who answered him that his soldiers had left him neither cock nor hen, that they were retired and shut up into the rock Clermont, and that he would not advise him to go any further for fear of the scouts, because they were enormously furious, which he easily believed, and therefore lodged that night with the miller. That The next morning... He went with a trumpeter to the gate of the castle, and required the guards he might be admitted to speak with the king of, of somewhat that concerned him. These words being told unto the king, he would by no means consent that they should open the gate, but, getting upon the top of the bulwark, said unto the ambassador, What is the news? What have you to say? 
Then the ambassador began to speak af as followeth. Book 1, Chapter 31, The Speech Made by Gallet to Picrochot There cannot arise amongst men a juster cause of grief than when they receive hurt and damage where they may justly expect for favor and good will, and not without cause, though without reason have many, after they had fallen into such a calamitous accident, esteemed this indignity less supportable than the loss of their own lives, in such sort, sort that, if they have not been able, by force of arms nor any other means, by reach of wit or subtlety, to stop them in their course and restrain their fury, they have fallen into desperation and utterly deprived themselves of this light. It is therefore no wonder if King Grangousier, my master, be full of high displeasure and much disquieted in mind upon thy outrageous and hostile coming. But truly it would be a marvel if he were not sensible of and moved with the incomparable abuses and injuries perpetrated by thee and thine upon those of his country, towards whom there hath been no example of inhumanity omitted, which in itself is to him so grievous for the cordial affection wherewith he has always cherished his subjects, that more it cannot be to any mortal man. Yet in this, above human apprehension, is it to him the more grievous that these wrongs and sad offenses have been committed by thee and thine, who, time out of mind, from all antiquity, thou and thy predecessors have been in a continual league and amity with him and all his ancestors, which, even unto this time, you have as sacred together, inviolably preserved, kept and entertained, so well, that not he and his only, but the very barbarous nations of the Poic de Vain, Bretons, Marceau, and those that dwell beyond the Isles of the Canaries, and that of Isabella, have thought it as easy to pull down the firmament, and to set up the depths above the clouds, as to make a breach in your alliance, and have been so afraid of it in their enterprises, that they have never dared to provoke incense or and damage the one for fear of the other nay which is more the sacred league hath so filled the world that there are few nations at this day inhabiting throughout all the continent and isles of the nations who have not ambitiously aspired to be received into it upon your own covenants and conditions holding your joint confederacy in as high esteem as their own territories and dominions <laughs> and there's the monk that killed like a million dudes <sighs> well <laughs> okay why well, I lose myself here okay it's such sort that from the memory of man there, uh, in the memory of man there hath not been le prince or league so wild and proud that durst have offered to invade I say not your countries but not so much as those of your confederates and if by rash and heady counsel they have attempted any new design against them as soon as they heard the name and title of your alliance they have suddenly desisted from their enterprises. What rage and madness, therefore, doth now incite thee, an old alliance infringed, all amity trod under foot, and all right violated, thus in a hostile manner to invade his country, without having been by him or his in anything prejudiced, wronged, or provoked? Where is faith? Where is law? Where is reason? Where is humanity? Where is fear of God? Dost thou think that those atrocious abuses are hidden from the eternal spirit and the supreme God who is the just rewarder of all our undertakings? If thou so think, thou deceivest thyself, for all things shall come to pass, as in his incomprehensible judgment he hath appointed. Is it thy fatal dead destiny, or influences of the stars, that would put an end to thy so long enjoyed ease and rest? For that all things have their end and period, so as that when they are come to the superlative point of their greatest height. They are in a trist, tumbled down again, as not being able to abide long in that state. This is the conclusion and end of those who cannot by reason and temperance moderate their fortunes and prosperities. But if it be predestinated that thy happiness and ease must now come to an end, must it needs be by wronging my king, him by whom thou wert established? If thy house must come to ruin, should it therefore in its fall crush the heels of him that set it up? The matter is so unreasonable and so dissonant from common sense that hardly can it be conceived by human understanding, 
and altogether incredible unto strangers, till by the certain and undoubted effects thereof it may be made apparent wow, that nothing is either sacred or holy to those who, having emancipated themselves from God and reason, do merely follow the perverse affections of their own depraved nature. If any wrong had been done by us to thy subjects and dominions, if we had favored thy ill-willers, if we had not assisted thee in thy need, if thy name and reputation had been wounded by us, or, to speak more truly, if the calumniating spirit, tempting to induce thee to evil, had by false illusions and deceitful fantasies put into thy conceit the impression of a thought that we had done unto thee anything unworthy of our ancient correspondence and friendship, thou oughtest first to have inquired out the truth, and afterwards by a seasonable warning to admonish us thereof. And we should have so satisfied thee, according to thine own heart's decree, that thou shouldst have had occasion to be contented. But, O oh, eternal God, what is thy enterprise? Wouldst thou, like a perfidious tyrant, thus spoil and lay waste my master's kingdom? Hast thou found him so silly and blockish that he would not, or so destitute of men and money, of counsel and skill and military discipline, that he cannot withstand thy unjust invasion? March hence presently, and to-morrow, some time of the day, retreat unto thine own country, without doing any kind of violence or disorderly act, by the way, and pay withal a thousand besans of gold, which in English money amounteth to five thousand pounds, for reparation of the damages thou hast done in this country. Half thou shalt half thou shalt pay to-morrow, and the other half at the Ides of May next coming, leaving with us in the meantime four hostages, the Dukes of Turnbank, Low Buttock, and Small Trash, together with the Prince of Itches and Viscount of Snatchbit. That's Tournemoil, Badefess, Menoy, Gratel, and Morpiai. <laughs> I prefer the English translations for the most part. Chapter Book One, Chapter Thirty Two. How Grangousier, to buy peace, caused the cakes to be restored. With that, the good man Gellert held his peace, but Picrochol, to all his discourse, answered nothing but, Come and fetch them, come and fetch them. They have bollocks fair and soft. They will need and provide some cakes for you. Then returned he to Grand Goussier, whom he found upon his knees, bareheaded, crouching in the little corner of his cabinet, and humbly praying unto God that he would vouchsafe to assuage the collar of Picrochol, and bring him to the rule of reason without proceeding by force. When the good man came back, he asked him, Ha, my friend, what news do you bring me? There is neither hope nor remedy, said Gallet. The man is quite out of his wits and forsaken of God. Yea, but, said Grangousier, my friend, what cause doth he to pretend for his outrages? He did not show me any cause at all, said Gallet, only that in a great anger he spoke some words of cakes. I cannot tell if they have done any wrong to his cake bakers. I will know, said Grangousier, the matter thoroughly, before I resolve any more upon what is to be done. Then sent he to learn concerning that business, and found by true information that his men had taken violently some cakes from Picrochol's people, and that Marquet's head was broken with a slack or short cudgel. That, nevertheless, all was well paid, and that the said Marquet had first hurt Forgier with a stroke of his whip athwart the legs. And it seemed good to his whole council that he should defend himself with all his might. Notwithstanding all this, said Grangousier, seeing the question is but about a few cakes, I will labor to content him, for I am very unwilling to wage war against him. He inquired then what quantity of cakes they had taken away, and understanding that it was but some four or five dozen, he commanded five cartloads of them to be baked that same night, and that there should be one full of cakes made with fine butter, fine yolks of eggs, fine saffron, and fine spice, to be bestowed upon Marquet, unto whom likewise he directed to be given seven hundred thousand and three philips, that is, at three shillings the piece, one hundred five thousand pounds and nine shillings of English money, for reparation of his loss and hindrances, and for satisfaction of the chirurgian that had dressed his wound, 
and furthermore settled upon him and his forever in freehold the apple orchard called La Pomardziar. Ooh, sounds nice. For the conveyance and passing of all, which was sent Gallet, who, by the way, as they went, made them gather near the willow trees great stores of bows, canes, and reeds, wherewith all the carriers were enjoined to garnish and deck their carts, and each of them to carry one in his hand, as himself likewise did, and thereby to give to all thereby to give all men to understand that demanded but peace, and that they came to buy it. Being come to the gate, they required to speak with Picrochol from Grand Goussier. Picrochol would not so much as let them in, nor go to speak with them, but sent them word that he was busy, that they should deliver their mind to Captain Duc Dion, who was then planting a piece of ordnance upon the wall. Then said the good man unto him, My lord, to ease you of all of this labor, and to take away all excuses why you may not return unto our former alliance, we do here presently restore unto you the cakes upon which the quarrel arose. Five dozen did our people take away. They were well paid for. We love peace so well that we restore unto you five cartloads, of which this cart shall be for Marquet, who doth most complain. Besides, to content him entirely, here are seven hundred thousand and three Philips, which I deliver to him, and for the losses he may pretend to have sustained. I resign forever the farm of the Pomardziar, to be possessed in fee simple by him and his forever, without the payment of any duty, or acknowledgment of homage, fealty, fine, or service whatsoever, and here is the tenor of the deed. And, for God's sake, let us live henceforth, henceforward in peace, and withdraw yourselves merrily into your own country from within this place, unto which you have no right at all, as you yourselves must needs confess, and let us be good friends as before. Tuc Dillon related all this to Picrochol, and more and more exasperated his courage, saying to him, These clowns are afraid to some purpose. By G, Gragusier conscates himself for fear, the poor drinker. He is not skilled in warfare, nor hath he any stomach for it. He knows better how to empty the flagons. That is his art. I am of opinion that it is fit we send back the carts and the money, and for the rest, that we very speedily that very speedily we fortify ourselves here, then prosecute our fortune. But what? Do they think to have to do with a ninny-whoop to feed you thus with cakes? You may see what it is. The good usage and great familiarity which you have with him heretofore hath made you contemptible in their eyes. Anoint a villain, he will prick you. Prick a villain, and he will anoint you. And I'm not reading the Latin. Sa, 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 said Picrochol. By St. James, you have given a true character of them. One thing I will advise you, said Duc Dion. We are here but badly, badly victualled and furnished with mouth harness very slenderly. If Grand Goussier should come to besiege us, I would go presently and pluck out all of your soldiers' heads and mine own all the teeth except three to each of us, and with them alone we should make an end of our precision, provisions all too soon. We shall have, said Picrochol, but too much sustenance in feeding stuff. Came we hither to eat or to fight? To fight indeed, said Duc Dion, yet from the paunch comes the dance, and where famine rules, force is exiled. Leave off your prating, said Picrochol, and forthwith seize upon what they have brought. Then took they money and cakes, oxen and carts, and sent them away without speaking one word, only that they should come no more so near, for a reason that they would give them the morrow after. Thus, without doing anything, returned they to Grand Goussier, and related the whole matter unto him, subjoining that there was no hope left to draw them to peace but by sharp and fierce wars. I think we'll uh, we'll see where this uh, this next chapter leaves us in terms of time. I'm starting to feel <laughs> I'm starting to get a little weary here. <sighs> Book 1, Chapter 23. Sorry, 33. How some statesmen of Picrochol, by harebrained counsel, put him in extreme danger. The carts being unloaded, and the money and cakes secured, there came before Picrochol the Duke of Small Trash, the Earl Swashbuckler, and Captain Dirttail. Menot, sorry, Menoy, Spadassin, and Merdai. 
I wouldn't. I th don't think I would have translated Spider Saiyan as Swashbuckler, but okay. <laughs> this was uh, this was the precursor to Cake Wars, if memory serves. Anyway, uh, Captain Dirtail, who said unto him, Sir, this day we make you the happiest, the most warlike and chivalrous prince that ever was since the death of Alexander of Macedonia. Be covered, be covered, said Picrochot. Gramercy, said they, we do but our duty. The matter is, the manner is thus. You shall leave some captain here to have the charge of this garrison, with a party competent for keeping of the place, which, besides its natural strength, is made stronger by the rampiers and fortresses of your devising. Your army you are to divide into two parts, as you know very well how to do. One part thereof shall fall upon Grand Goussier and his forces. By it shall he be easily at the very first shock routed, and then you shall get money by heaps, for the clown hath store of ready coin. Clown we call him, because the noble and generous prince hath never a penny, and that to hoard up treasure is but a clownish trick. The other part of the army, in the meantime, shall draw towards Onis, Chiantange, Angomois, and Gascony. Then march to Perigot, Medoc, and Ilans, taking wherever you come, without resistance, towns, castles, and forts. Afterwards to Bayonne, St. John le Duluc, to Fontarabia, where you shall seize upon all the ships, and coasting along Galicia and Portugal, shall pillage all the maritime places, even unto Lisbon where you shall be supplied with all necessaries befitting a conqueror. By Copsody, Spain will yield, for they are but a race of lubies. There are you to pass by the Straits of Gibraltar, where you shall erect two pillars more stately than those of Hercules, to the perpetual memory of your name, and the narrow entrance there, narrow entrance there shall be called the Picrochelonial Sea. Having passed the Picrochelonal Sea, behold, Barbarossa yields himself your slave. I will, said Picrochel, give him fair quarter and spare his life. Yea, said they, so that he be content to be christened. And you shall conquer the kingdoms of Tunis, of Hippo, Argier, Bomin, Coron, yea, all Barbary. Furthermore, you shall take into your hands Majorca, Minorca, Sardinia, Corsica, with the other islands of the Ligustic and Balearian seas. Going alongst on the left hand, you shall rule all Gallia Narbonessis, Provence, the Allobrogians, Genoa, Florence, Lucca, and then, God be we ye, Rome. Our poor Monsieur the Pope dies now for fear. By my faith, said Picrochol, I will not then kiss his pantoufle. Italy being thus taken, behold Naples, Calabria, Apulia, and Sicily, all ransacked, and Malta too. I wish the pleasant knights of Rhodes heretofore would but come to resist you, though we might see their urine. I would, said Picrochol, very willingly go to Loreto. No, no, said they, that shall be at our return. From thence we will sail eastwards, and take Candia, Cyprus, Rhodes, and the Cyclade Islands, and set upon the Moria. It is ours, by Saint Trenian. The Lord preserve Jerusalem, for the great Sultan is not comparable to you in power. I will then, said he, cause Solomon's temple to be built. No, said they, not yet. Have a little patience. Stay a while. Be never too sudden in your enterprises. Can you tell what Octavian Augustus said? Festina Lante. It is re requisite that you first have lesser a Asia, Caria, Lycia, Pamphylia, Cilicia, Lydia, Phrygia, Mysia, Bithynia, Carazia, Satalia, Samagaria, Castamania, Luga, Savasta, even unto Euphrates. Shall we see, said Picrochol, Babylon, and Mount Sinai? There is no need, said they at this time. Have we not hurried up and down, traveled and toiled enough, and having transfretted and passed over the Hyrcanian Sea, marched alongst the two Armenias and the three Arabias? I, by my faith, said he. We have played the fools and are undone. Ha, poor souls, what's the matter, said they. What shall we have, said he, to drink in these deserts? For Julian Augustus with his whole army died there for thirst, as they say. 
We have already, said they, given order for that. In the Syriac Sea you have nine thousand and fourteen great ships laden with the best wines in the world. They arrived at Port Joppa. There they found two and twenty thousand camels and sixteen hundred elephants, which you shall have at have taken at one hunting about Sigelmis, which you entered into Libya, and besides this, you had all the Mecca caravan. Did they not furnish you sufficiently with wine? Yes, but, said he, we did not drink it fresh. By the virtue, said they, not of a fish, a valiant man, a conqueror, who pretends and aspires to the monarchy of the world, cannot always have his ease. God be thanked that you and your men are come safe and sound unto the banks of the river Tigris. But, said he, what doth that part of our army in the meantime which overthrows that unworthy Swilpot Grangousier? They are not idle, said they. We shall meet with them by and by. They will. Ha they shall have won you Brittany, Normandy, Flanders, Hainaut, Brabant, Artois, Holland, Zealand. They have passed over the Rhine, over the bellies of the Switzers and the Landsquenets, and a party of these have subdued Luxembourg, Lorraine, Champagne, and Savoy, even to Lyon, in which place they have met with your forces returning from the naval conquests of the Mediterranean seas, and have rallied again in Bohemia, after they have plundered and sacked Suevia, Wittenberg, Bavaria, Austria, Moravia, and Styria. <coughs> Dang. Lubies. Then they set fiercely together upon Lubeck, Norway, Sweden, Rye, Denmark, Gitland, Greenland, the Stirlands, even unto the frozen sea. This done, they have conquered the Isles of Orkney and subdued Scotland, England, and Ireland. From thence sailing through the Sandy Sea and by the Sarmates, they have vanquished and overcome Prussia, Poland, Lithuania, Russia, Wallachia, Transylvania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Turkeyland, and are now at Constantinople. Come, said Pickershol, let us go join with them quickly, for I will be Emperor of Trebizond also. Shall we not kill all these dogs, Turks and... Mahometans? What a devil should what a devil should we do else, said they. And you shall give their gods and lands to such as shall have you served you honestly. Reason, said he, will have it so, that is but just. I give unto you the Camaria, Syria, and all the Palestine. Ha, sir, said they. It is out of your goodness, Gramercy, we thank you. God grant God grant you may always prosper. There was present at that time an old gentleman well experienced in the wars, a stern soldier who had been in many great hazards, named Eshephron, who, hearing this discourse, said, I do not greatly doubt that all this enterprise will be like the tale or interlude of the pitcher full of milk, wherewith, wherewith a shoemaker made himself rich in conceit, but when the pitcher was broken, he had not whereupon to dine. What do you pretend by these large conquests? What shall be the end of so many labors and crosses? Thus it shall be, said Picrochol, that when we are returned we shall sit down, rest, and be merry. But, said Eshephron, if by chance you should never come back, for the voyage is long and dangerous, were it not better for us to take our rest now than unnecessarily expose ourselves to so many dangers? Oh, said Swashbuckler, by gee, here is a good dotard. Come, let us go hide ourselves in the corner of a chimney, and there spend the whole time of our lives amongst ladies, in the threading of pearls, or spinning like Sardana Pallas. He that nothing ventures hath neither horse nor mule, said Solomon. He would ventureth too much, said Eshephron, loseth both horse and mule, answered Malcon. Or Malchon. Enough, said Picrochol, go forward. I fear nothing but that these devilish legions of Grand Goussier, whilst we are in Mesopotamia, will come on our backs and charge up our rear. What course shall we then take? What will be our remedy? A very good one, said Dirt Tail. A pretty little commission, which you must send unto the Muscovites, shall bring you into the field in an instant four hundred and fifty thousand choice men of war. Oh, that you would but make me your lieutenant general. I should for the lightest faults of any inflict great punishments. I fret, I charge, I strike, I take, I kill, I slay, I play the devil. On, on, said Picrochol. Make haste, my lads, and let him that loves me follow me. And I think that's where I'm going to take pause, because my throat's a little bit sore. Hopefully it was entertaining. 
And um, as they say, goodbye, world.